Thank you. That concludes the debate on regulation of Legal Services Scotland Bill at Stage 1. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion 11800 in the name of Shona Robison on a financial resolution for the regulation of Legal Services Scotland Bill. And I call on Siobhan Brown to move the motion. I move the motion, Presiding Officer. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is a debate on motion 12252 in the name of Shona Robison on Scottish Income Tax Rate Resolution 2024 to 25. Just allow a moment for front benches to organise themselves. And can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons? Thank you. And I call on Shona Robinson to move the motion. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, formally moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call on Tom Arthur to speak to the motion. Up to seven minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to draw the Parliament's attention to the procedural connection between this debate and Rule 9.16.7 of the standing orders which states that a Scottish rates resolution must be agreed before stage three of the budget bill is able to proceed. Presiding officer, this rates resolution debate is set against a backdrop of one of the most challenging periods for the public finances in the devolution era. Our economy has been damaged by Brexit. We have faced a period of continued high inflation and we have a Tory UK government that is failing to deliver the investment needed in public services. And just last week, it was confirmed the UK has entered a technical recession. UK government spending decisions have resulted in a real terms cut of 1.2% in our block grant funding since 2022-23. This backdrop presents huge challenges for the government here in Scotland, which is committed to progressing our three core missions of equality, opportunity and community. Therefore, presiding officer, in the 2024-25 budget, we have taken the difficult but necessary decisions to allow us to sustain investment in our vital public services upon which so many people rely. Our principles as a government, commitment to progressive taxation and investing in the people of Scotland have guided our income tax policy decisions at the budget for 2024-25, we propose that no changes are made to the starter, basic, intermediate and higher rates of 19, 20, 21 and 42 per cent. We also propose that the starter and basic rate bans are increased by inflation. We propose that the higher rate and top rate thresholds are maintained at their current levels of £43,662 and £125,140 respectively. Finally, we propose the introduction of a new advance rate band of 45 pence, which will be applied on income between £75,001 £75, to £125,140, and an increase in the top rate by one pence to 48 pence. This proposed policy package will see more than half of taxpayers in Scotland continue to pay less than they would in the rest of the UK. The Scottish Fiscal Commission estimate that the advance rate will impact only the highest earning 5% of taxpayers in 2024-25. In fact, when recent changes to national insurance are accounted for, only employees who earn in excess of £100,000 will pay more tax in the coming financial year than they did in this year. Certainly. Blue Smith. Uh, I'm very grateful for the Minister giving way. Um, could the Scottish Government tell the Chamber what analysis it's done of the comments that have been made by the business community, most especially people like Sandy Begbie, who put on record last weekend that Scotland is becoming, and I quote, a dangerous place in which to create wealth? Minister. What I would note is that in the 2023 earnings grew by 8%, faster than in any other part of the UK. And of course, vital for the success of business and our overall economy are strong public services. And had we not taken these decisions to have a progressive tax policy in Scotland, we would find ourselves having to replicate the real terms cuts to public services that are being inflicted in England. 
Now, presiding officer, this is a I'm afraid I've got to make some more progress. I'll try and take an intervention shortly. This is a targeted tax package that will raise vital revenue to invest in public services while projecting the majority of taxpayers. The Scottish Fiscal Commission have forecast that the introduction of the advance rate and increase to the top rate will raise an additional £82 million in revenue next year. In addition, we estimate that maintaining the higher rate threshold at its 2023-24 level will raise a further £307 million. I'm afraid I have to make progress given the limited time I have available. We also estimate that our decisions on income tax since devolution could raise £1.5 billion more in 2024-25 compared to if we matched UK government policy. Our progressive approach means we can continue to support the most generous social contract in any part of the UK. This includes our flagship Scottish child payment, free prescriptions and free higher education all of which represent an investment in the people of Scotland. Presiding officer, I understand that many members of this parliament have questions about how these policies could affect taxpayer behaviour and the economy. As always, we have relied on independent forecasts by the Fiscal Commission, which show our policy raise revenues. However, I agree that given the influence of tax policy on the economy, it is essential for us to continue to monitor closely and, and further build our evidence on what we are doing. But critics of our approach also need to remember that slashing tax taxes and running down our vital public services would not make Scotland a better place in which to live, to work and to do business. Despite all of the uncertainty we face, our economy has been resilient. As I said, earnings in Scotland grew by 8% in 2023, faster than any other part of the United Kingdom, including London and the South East, providing a further boost to our tax revenues. This is one great, there is of course one great uncertainty that hangs over our plans, presiding officer, and that is the UK government's spring budget. This will have a material impact on Scotland's budget, yet we are not cited on any of these plans whatsoever. Bluntly, we are left to guess based on speculation in newspapers. If the various media trails are to be believed, that will see further cuts to spending on vital public services and further cuts to tax. It goes without saying that this approach would be unsustainable. Just last month, the IMF warned the UK government against further tax cuts, stressing the need to boost key areas of public spending instead. Having no clarity over the Chancellor's intentions puts us in a difficult situation. While we can continue to prepare for possible outcomes, a late announcement of tax cuts would highlight that with the limited powers of devolution, we are still beholden to the whims of Westminster, and it is only with this Parliament having full powers that we can have a fiscal policy fully designed and delivered to Scotland to benefit Scotland. Presiding officer, this government is clear on what its priorities are. We are choosing to invest in our social contract, to invest in the people of Scotland and to invest in the Scottish economy. And that is why I ask members to vote to ratify the proposed changes to Scottish income tax in 2024-25. Thank you. And I now call on Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Next week uh, on Tuesday, the Parliament will debate stage three of the budget. Uh, and I'm sure that debate will be just as robust as it was at stage one and just as robust as the questions from all members of the Finance Committee at stage two uh, earlier this week. Uh, today, however, is about the standing orders procedure which states that a resolution must be agreed uh, ahead of the stage three process. Now, I want to use today's debate not just to respond to some of the issues um, that, uh, well, I think it's already very clear why the Scottish Conservatives are so concerned about the Scottish Government's current tax policy, uh, which we believe echoes the concerns of so many uh, sectors across the country, but also some of the inherent difficulties within this particular budget process, not just for uh, MSPs in this parliament who have been engaged in the scrutiny of the budget, but also for local government too. Back in October, uh, we learnt from the First Minister that there was to be a council tax freeze. Even if a move like this is actually the remit of local authorities rather than for the First Minister to decide. It was abundantly clear that there was no consultation about this. In fact, uh, allegedly some of the Cabinet didn't even know about it. Local government certainly didn't. And at a time when they were starting to plan ahead for their budgets, they had no idea what the council tax freeze was to be fully funded. 
Yes, it was, said the Deputy First Minister in the Budget Statement on the 19th of December. The Council tax freeze was to be fully funded, but the accompanying arithmetic in the Budget made it abundantly clear that that was not the case, which is probably why uh, Argyll and Butte Council has just voted to increase their Council tax by 10%. Just, I will in a minute. Now, Shona Robson finally makes the admission that it was not fully funded. And this letter that uh, was received by, council tax, with, by councils from the Deputy First Minister yesterday um, makes it very clear that it wasn't fully funded. And that has been an issue for this particular budget. I give way to the Deputy First Minister to tell us why she didn't say anything about this at stage two. Deputy First Minister. So Liz Smith is conflating two things. One is the general revenue grant position, which uh, we are giving funding of £62.7 million, and the council tax freeze monies of £147 million. So the two things are different pots of money. But in terms of Argyll and Butte, uh, Argyll and Butte, uh, which I hope uh, will reconsider their position, are actually going to leave themselves £400,000 worse off than had they accepted uh, the money that is for that purpose. Does she think, Liz Smith, think that's, that's a sensible decision from our, our Gail and Butte administration? Liz Smith. Yeah. What, what Liz Smith thinks and what councils think it, is that the decisions that have been made by the Scottish Government completely undermine the Verity House Agreement and uh, the ability of the Scottish uh, uh, Parliament to be able to improve the financial scrutiny of the budget and that, that's this issue for this particular rates resolution because there have been other very significant scrutiny issues within this budget process, uh, something that the convener of the Finance Committee put up uh, on uh, record uh, during stage two about the potential uh, behavioural changes following the tax changes. Now uh, the Minister has just responded that the, um, the government is going to keep a, a watching brief on that. The problem is that that watching brief is going to be taking place after the changes have actually uh, been made. And so the modelling, which I don't think has actually been done by the Scottish Government, um, it is not any more extensive than some of the um, recommendations that have been made by the Scottish Fiscal Commission. We don't know what that modelling process actually is. And also, it is the same, exactly the same for the proposed uh, surtax, surtax on business rates, because Again, and I came back to the uh, stage two discussions, Cabinet Secretary says that there's been no uh, discuss discussion about that as yet because the evidence hasn't been put before. I don't understand how that can be become a proposal if the evidence and the modelling hasn't actually taken place. And that is a serious issue for this Parliament when it comes to this budget because we have to be engaging in the proper scrutiny process and the rates resolution should uh, reflect that. Now, as we know, it, it is very clear that businesses are extremely worried in Scotland uh, about the effect of this budget. There is, in fact, there has been universal criticism of this budget. And uh, when I asked the Cabinet Secretary to name those sectors which supported the government's uh, income tax changes, she couldn't provide me with any names, and I think that's uh, pretty telling. Presiding officer, this scrutiny matters a lot. The Finance Committee was fully accepting of the difficulties that the uh, Scottish Government faces in light of the timing of the uh, Chancellor's spring budget. But in paragraph 142 of the Committee's report, we note that the Scottish Government has so far failed to produce a full response to the Scottish Fiscal Commission's sustainability report, which of course flags up the large persistent black hole in the Scottish Government's finances. And in recent weeks, this Parliament has witnessed a great deal of discussion about that. And I'm sure we'll come to that again in stage three. So I finish my comments, um, presiding officer, on the fact that I'm sure we will uh, yet again on Tuesday uh, debate our very different party political approaches to this budget. But what really matters for this rates resolution is the ability to the, of this Parliament to scrutinise what is behind the decisions of the Scottish Government. And as yet, we will not, I don't think, as Conservatives, be the only people expressing our very deep-seated concerns. Thank you. I now call on Michael Mara. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Scottish Labour will not support the rate resolution today. Scottish Labour believes in progressive taxation, but these proposals are far 
from Progressive. And as with the rest of the SNP's budget, these resolutions are devoid of any strategy to help grow our economy. Well, changes to the top of the income tax system will raise a paltry £8 million. A far more significant contribution, £307 million, comes from fiscal drag by freezing the threshold for higher rate at £43,663. And it epitomises this government, presiding officer, that the most... No, thank you. No, I'm just, I'm just getting started. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. It epitomises this government that the most significant decision they have made is to do nothing. And the Deputy First Minister told this chamber that our government believes that those with the broadest shoulders should pay a higher rate of tax. So, who earns £43,000 in Scotland today? Nurses, teachers and police officers. Ask them, do they feel rich? Mortgages up, no thank you, mortgages up, rents up, energy Let's bills you, Mr. up, Mara. the price of the weekly shop up, up, up. Accounting for every penny, eking out their household budgets, hoping the car doesn't need new tyres, that the boiler doesn't need fixed, or that the kids need new shoes. And every person in this country earning £28,850 per year pays more tax in Scotland and is getting less and less in return. No thank you, sir. These people do not have broad shoulders, and they are not rich. Far from it. In a cost-of-living crisis, the SNP want nurses, teachers and police officers to pay more and all to bail out a profligate, incompetent government that has wasted their money. And this week, the SNP's latest tax position, oil and gas companies raking in record profits, should get a free pass. Tax rises for nurses and tax cuts for oil giants. The flagship changes to tax policy, the new advanced rate of 45p and top rate is increasing to 48 pence. That is forecast to raise £82 million with over half of the unadjusted revenues being wiped out by behaviour change. And no work appears to have been done whatsoever on the labour market effects, presiding officer, of their tax changes. Labour remains deeply concerned about the impact on Scotland's ability to recruit and retain key workers in our NHS and in our wider economy. Recruiting breast cancer oncologists from abroad, those that do come are negotiating net pay as the Finance Committee in the Parliament has heard. Those that do not come are ending up in places with tax rates that they prefer. All the while, the waiting lists in our NHS continue to grow and grow. And what about head teachers in our primary schools? A national shortage when the work does not seem worth the wages, caught by these tax hikes. Nothing done to mitigate the impact in key labour shortage areas through adjusted pay rates or conditions. But the very concept of all of this appears to be alien, no thank you, appears to be alien to a government, alien to a government that seeks tax solely as a means of plugging the hole left by their failure to grow the economy. Yep. These tax rates will not plug the overall gap, of course, with the national shortfall forecast to rise yet further to as much as £1.9 billion by 2017. 28, and they will be back for more. I have seen nothing from this government resembling a plan to address that most pressing of challenges, the growth in our economy. Instead, they are out of ideas, continually trying and failing to use tax as a substitute for economic growth. Getting our economy growing should be the number one priority. That is an idea for you, Deputy First Minister. If Scotland's economy had grown at the rate of the north-west of England in the last decade, it would be £11.5 billion larger. Just think what that could mean for investment in our public services and in our communities. Instead, we have a chaotic budget of cuts across the board, including key areas that would support that economic growth. Colleges, universities, housing, the list goes on. There is no strategy for growth, only ever-increasing taxes. Let's hear Mr Mara. Presiding officer, I, 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 there is no strategy for growth, only for ever-increasing taxes on hard-working Scots, while Hamza Yusuf and all its oil Let and gas giants Mr. Mara. off the hook. In a cost-of-living crisis, as Rishi's recession bites, hard-working Scots should not have to pay the price for the failures of two incompetent governments. Yeah. Thank you. And I now call on Ross Greer up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Excuse me a second. 
One of the Scottish Government's defining missions is tackling poverty, especially child poverty. And in this financial year alone, 90,000 children are being lifted out of poverty as a result of Scottish Government policies. And the budget for the coming financial year includes a billion pounds of additional social security spending alongside actions like wiping out all school meal debt and expanding free school meals, which the Scottish Greens have been proud to champion. Tackling the big challenges like child poverty or the climate crisis requires huge state intervention. There isn't a free market solution to either of those, nor is there a free market solution to health care, to justice, to education. So we need to pay for these things, primarily through taxation. And Scotland has the most progressive tax system, tax and social security system, anywhere in the UK, as confirmed by the IFS. Through our income tax reforms over the last few years, through doubling council tax on second homes, increasing the additional dwelling supplement and other measures, we are redistributing wealth from the richest and the wealthiest to the most vulnerable in our society. That is the litmus test for a progressive government, which is why Labour's opposition today is so revealing. The specific further reform in today's resolution ends the frankly somewhat absurd situation where one income tax band, the higher band, spans £82,000 of income. That's twice the range of the three lower bands and the personal allowance combined. The Scottish Greens were proud to argue for this change, and I believe it was a personal commitment of the First Minister's from his leadership campaign. But I want to thank the STUC in particular for their leadership on this, which does answer Liz Smith's question of who supports these tax proposals. Scottish, uh, Scotland's trade union movement supports these tax proposals. They were the ones to advance them in the first place. I expect and understand the Conservatives' opposition to progressive taxation and well-funded public services, but there is a dichotomy when they simultaneously oppose tax rises for the better off and demand more spending on a wide range of services. But it's Labour's... Yes? Liz Smith. I'm grateful to Mr Greer giving way. What's concerning us is the fact that the business community and those who are most likely to be in the position to stimulate economic growth are deeply concerned about the extent of the problems within this government's budget, not only in raising uh, tax, but also the differentials between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Does he accept that there is deep-seated concern amongst the business community? I'm grateful for that intervention and I accept that the concern is there but as I'm going to address later here I don't think it's borne out by the last five years of evidence of progressive income tax reforms but I want to focus on Labour's position first for a moment though because it's just astonishing in that the Labour Party are now adopting a near word-for-word -word repeat of Tory tax policy. Labour MSPs are fond of saying as Michael Mara just has that those on £28,500 pay more tax in Scotland. Yes £6 more a year and for that they get free bus travel for under 22s and over 60s, free college and university education, free prescriptions, the best paid public sector workers like the teachers that Mr Mara referenced anywhere in the UK. No, he's got to be joking. He wouldn't take a single intervention. Um, in Scotland, workers get so much more for that £6 a year, and yet the Labour Party rejects that. It's abundantly clear to all of us that Keir Starmer set Scottish Labour's tax policies, not an As Sarwar or Michael Mara, but they're the ones left doing the public an explanation of where the £1.5 billion of Labour cuts to public services would land. There is an element of the boy who cried wolf here with some opponents of progressive taxation. We've been making these changes for five years, and every time they've declared that this would be the tipping point, resulting in less revenue coming in as people change their behaviour or move south, but the reality is that total tax take is up. And net migration from the rest of the UK to Scotland is positive. A higher quality of public services is a pool factor, which people are willing to pay a little bit more for if they're on an above average salary. Liz Smith mentioned Sandy Begbie, who have a great deal of time for, but I have to say that every worker is a wealth creator, not just those at the top. And too often these debates proceed as if the only people driving our economy are the high earners, the chief executives and the company owners. That's not and has never been the case. Ordinary workers are clearly better off in Scotland than in the rest of the UK must conclude, in terms Mr. of the Greer. balance of tax and public services that they receive. I believe a majority, a broad majority in this chamber and across the country want to see a more social democratic and a fairer Scotland. By voting for this rates resolution today, we are taking one further step towards that. Thank you. And I will call on Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, Scotland needs predictability and a long-term plan for both tax and the wider economy, not erratic changes that will undermine confidence. Scottish Liberal Democrats voted for the tax resolution last year. However, I warned them about tipping points. High earners are mobile. 
they can shift earnings to their pensions. UK firms that want to expand their workforce can look to places like Newcastle, Manchester, elsewhere. And the Fraser Valander Institute analysis suggests that raising the top rate of tax to 48% will raise just £8 million against behavioural change. To put that in context, the SNP's ferry fiasco stands at about £250 million over budget as chicken feed. And listen to what the BMA say on the new advanced £75,000 uh, tax rate. Dr Ian Kennedy said this measure may push more of those doctors out of the NHS to jobs elsewhere or even to retirement. Between these changes at the top rate and the advance rate, the Scottish Fiscal Commission's that the behaviour change, behavioural changes could be as much as £118 million next year. But there is a contract here as well, because the biggest increases in the overall tax take will actually come from fiscal drag on low and middle income earners. This is an SNP Green government that is taking tax to higher and higher levels without understanding the impact on behaviours or the economy or on those already struggling to get by. I'm afraid the Minister had no time for interventions. I have considerably less time than him. I have to make progress. Taxpayers and businesses have no idea what is going to happen next. And this is not an environment which is conducive to growth and giving people the confidence to invest here. Presiding officer, moving overnight from a position of hiking council tax by record amounts to freezing it again speaks to a government that is reactionary and operating without any sort of vision for a tax strategy. An SNP tax plan just don't work. They added a further penny on, last, on tax last year with the defined purpose, a purpose that we supported, of supporting our NHS. But the crisis in our health service has not got any better. While the IFS has warned that health spending is actually set to drop in 24-25, and so the social contract at the heart of this is being stretched to breaking point. Tax is being ramped up in an attempt to cover SNP failure to grow our economy and hide the incompetence and waste that is embodied by the ferries, but exists in so many other portfolios as well. And the SNP's choices mean that Scotland has missed a big opportunity to raise revenues that could have allowed different decisions on tax and public spending. Members will recall my long-standing objections to how Scotland leasing process was run. It sold Scotland's prized seabed for wind farms on the cheap, achieving only a fraction of the prices being seen elsewhere in the world. It inexplicably capped the price that companies were allowed to pay for Scotland sites, botching the best chance for generations at bringing serious money into our Scottish economy. Almost half of that money, £310 million from the 10-year licences that were sold in that auction, will be spent in the current year alone to prop up SNP green spending and financial mismanagement. And the problem is, once that, once that money is gone, it's gone. Those rights are only sold once. No annual payments exist, as happens in England. And we will be waiting five to ten years for more money to start arriving in the form of rents on them as, as yet unbuilt wind farms. So the government is burning through this cash without a plan for what happens to public services afterwards. And the excuse that is spending money on the journey to net zero just doesn't fly when we have a budget before us that strips money out of green initiatives left, right and centre. Thank you. And I, we move to winding up speeches and I call on Tom Arthur to wind up. Up to four minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank members for their um, revealing contributions this afternoon. <laughs> um, turning to, to Liz Smith, um, Liz Smith always, I think, makes very measured um, contributions and they reflect her own political philosophy and we have a fundamental difference in that. But there is a key issue here, which she speaks about modelling and what the consequences of decisions may be. And of course, that is something that will come out and we will monitor, we will have updated forecasts and outturn eventually. But what we do know is what the consequences would be of not taking these decisions. And that's what I touched on in my opening remarks. It would mean cuts to public services. And that is simply not something that we can sustain. We are committed to a social contract and we are committed to investing in the people of Scotland. And that is why we put forward progressive tax policies to enable us to achieve that. 
I'm afraid I've only got a very small amount of time. I want to address a few other points before concluding. Mm. I'm very grateful to, to Ross Greer for his contribution. I think he makes a very powerful point, recognising the contribution of everyone across Scotland to creating wealth in our society and to supporting a sustainable and prosperous economy. And that is something that we have to bear in mind. And recognise, of course, that the majority of taxpayers in Scotland will be paying less tax than they will if they were living south of the border or simultaneously enjoying a range of benefits which are not afforded to our friends and neighbours in England. Uh, turning to the contribution of the Labour Party, uh, there was two principal criticisms on the rates resolution from Mr Mara. It was with regards to the point at which people in Scotland pay more tax than they do in England, and it was also the point around the higher threshold. That is the situation that prevails today. It prevails today because we had a rates resolution vote in Parliament in February of last year. The Labour Party voted for that. Yeah. Not only did the Labour Party vote for it, their finance spokesperson stated that he welcomed these proposals and that they were progressive. Yeah. We are not even to I'm the end Daniel, of the tax year, and proposals which are described by the Labour Party as progressive are now introduced by the leader of the Labour Party as being ludicrous, ludicrous, from progressive to ludicrous in one financial year. That is just simply not a sustainable position to, to engender credibility yeah. at all. Absolutely. Mr Mara also criticises the introduction of an advance rate of 75k. That, of course, is something that has been welcomed and called for by the STUC, by anti-poverty campaigners. Again, the Labour Party finding itself on the wrong side of the STUC and anti-poverty campaigners. <laughs> Shameful. But of course, presiding officer, as I, as I touched on in my uh, remarks earlier on, because of the changes that are taking place to national insurance, that means that there will be not an employee in Scotland earning less than £100,000 who, who will be paying more tax next year than they are this year. So no one under, earning under £100,000 will be paying cumulatively more tax next year than they are this year. Let me take you back to the Labour Manifesto in 2021. Scottish Labour believes that income tax should be fair and progressive. If there is a need to increase income tax revenues during the next parliamentary term, Scottish Labour would support changes that generate income from those earning over £100,000. So they contradict their own position last year. They're against the STUC and anti-poverty campaigners, and they're against their own manifesto. Presiding officer, if I was being charitable, I would characterise it as a U-turn. But to make a U-turn, you actually have to be in the driving seat. And we know that the front bench of the Labour Party are being taken for a ride by Keir Starmer. I urge members in the chamber to back this progressive rates resolution this evening. Thank you. Thank you. That, that concludes the debate on Scottish... Members, thank you. Let's just cease the conversations. That concludes the debate on the Scottish Income Tax Rate Resolution 2024 to 25. We'll now move on to the question on the motion. And Rule 11.3.1 requires the question on the Scottish Rate Resolution to be put immediately after the debate. So the question is that Motion 12252 in the name of Shona Robison on Scottish Income Tax Rate Resolution 2024 to 25 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote and there'll be a short suspension to allow members to access digital voting.